think of causal as uh, primarily fleet connectivity is the way I look at it. Uh, and uh, in that fleet connectivity piece, we work both on, as you would expect from the title, strategic leadership and also operational uh, level of war uh, programs. My operational level of war programs primarily are uh, being held and taught down at Evans Hall, right across from the Surface Warfare Officer School, a little bit north of here down the hill, uh, led by uh, retired Marine Corps Colonel Dick Finley. Uh, and in operational level programs, we have Maritime Staff Operators Course, Executive Level of War uh, Operators Course for 06s uh, that are gonna be on numbered fleet staffs, uh, flag level courses that are for joint and coalition force maritime component commanders. So we're talking the one, two, maybe three star level uh, type of leadership uh, out, out and about in the world. Uh, and then our uh, assist and assess teams, which are composed of about 25 folks, everybody with fleet experience, about uh, two thirds of them wearing uniforms actively, the other third being retired active duty, uh, and, you know, retired folks that used to wear a uniform and uh, they get out and about representing the fleet and, uh, ha and represent our connectivity here at the War College for those kind of programs. Plus, on the leadership and ethics side, uh, led by retired Captain John Myers, who's not here today. Unfortunately, uh, brother-in-law passed away the other day, so uh, uh, he is not part of the, this brief this afternoon. But he leads my leadership, our leadership, and ethics teams. Uh, today is the first of three ethics conferences that uh, we will have during the year, and as you might expect, because it's the first thing after you were sworn in as members of the new class, congratulations again on your services and your countries picking you to come to this great institution. Your job, by the way, is to make it better, among other things, and I trust that you will. But at any rate, uh, today, one of three sessions uh, on ethics. Very important that we kick off the, the year the right way. President, I know, will give us some words on that, as will Dr. Martin Cook, who holds the uh, James Bond Stockdale uh, uh, ethics uh, chair here at the War College. So uh, you can't ever and you won't ever hear from anybody uh, better on the subject uh, of professional ethics and uh, he is truly, in this case, world renowned, kind of like our president. Uh, Causal mission not only is to impact uh, the, the current Navy, but to impact the future Navy and so it's how we develop leaders that's really, really important and we're spending a lot of time with, and that's what we're starting to get into this afternoon in this uh, lecture year that's uh, about to follow. And like Admiral Winnefeld challenged you this morning, I challenge you, all of you, to take a deep dive on yourself this year, uh, professionally, personally, ethically, and as a human being. What kind of a person are you? Like the War College was for me, and unfortunately, I didn't have the fun of coming up here to Newport. I got to go to National War College at Fort McNair in D.C., but it doesn't matter. It's whatever War College you happen to be lucky enough to get to, and you are very lucky people here. This should be, should be the best year of your lives. It really should be. You're at a point in your career where not only do you have plenty of experience to work from, but you've been working so hard the odds are you've never had a chance to unpack some of the baggage that goes from your career to date. And I challenge you to unpack the bags this year. Open yourself up to deep thought, deep dive. Figure out some of the things that you never took the time to figure out before this year because you were too busy. Uh, and make yourselves better so that you can do what Admiral Winnefeld mentioned, which is setting yourself up for the future leadership of your service and maybe of your countries in some cases. Um, many of you, by the way, are coming off of multiple, talking specifically about the U.S. officers that are in here, but many of you are coming off of multiple combat tours. Really important that you, you individually, take the time to unpack the bags that you've kept closed for a while, because it's all about your future, and your future, everybody in this room here, it's all about leadership. Who you are as leaders, how you're gonna work for the second halves of your careers, as Admiral Winnefeld referred to this morning. And many of you, I can guarantee, are gonna lead at the very, very top levels of not only your services, but also the joint force, the coalition force, and that is around the globe very clearly. And we do know for fact that there are more than a few future service chiefs in this room, particularly among the international uh, members of this class. Uh, it's pretty impressive when you look at the numbers. And I, 
I ask you to do that sometime, and I ask you to think about it as this year goes along and use this year wisely. Now, there's nobody, nobody in this room that can talk about using the year wisely or no one wiser or more appropriate to lead off this thing and for us to follow the lead of during this next year than our president. And if you haven't read Admiral Christensen's bio, shame on you, but he's the son of a naval aviator and a Navy nurse. Blood is blue and gold, okay? Sorry, Army guys, it's the way it is. He's all in on everything he's ever done, whether it's commanding the McCluskey FIG-41, course appropriately named by for an attack aviator, right? There you go. Desron, Destroyer Squadron 21 on the John C. Stennis Battle Group, Carrier Strike Group 12 on the Enterprise, uh, SWAS right down the, hall, the hill here, the Mine and ASW Command, and uh, lastly is the president of InServe. Now he's here. He's a soccer player at the Naval Academy. You'll see him at the gym or the pool every single day. Talk about an example for lifelong fitness. The top in his class here at the War College. Sit down, sir. Stand down, stand down. So don't say, don't say that you cannot read every word that's assigned to you in this year because Admiral Christensen, I guarantee you did, and that's how he became top in his class. He also excelled at the Fletcher School at Harvard. You can learn from him. You can learn more from him professionally than anybody I've ever known. You can also learn from him as a family man. He's got a great family. He'll be embarrassed that I'm mentioning this, but his wife, Teresa, San Diego native, Uriah, she's wonderful. Three great kids. He delivered his daughter Grace to her junior year at Mary Washington this last weekend. A sad moment for any dad, but also a proud moment. Tim, his son, is going off to his freshman year at Hamden, Sydney, in Virginia this weekend. So again, sir, sorry about that. And you got young Matt to push on at Proud High School, uh, trying out for soccer this week. So what's the point? What's the point in mentioning this? You can do it all as a military officer or as a senior civilian in government service. You can, in fact, do it all, ethically, professionally, and personally. This guy, too, this president of ours, he knows his history. Don't challenge him. The quote that he gave you this morning, think before you speak, read before you think, it applies. You can tell I didn't think too much before I spoke this morning. I did, at any rate. And don't challenge him on either sports trivia or music trivia. Okay, again, challenges for the bar. I'm proud to introduce the man that I follow. He's got more energy and passion than anyone that I've ever known. The president, number 53, Commodore Luce told me that this morning. He says he's very proud of this guy, uh, and he wants him to continue what Luce started, Rear Admiral John Christensen. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. I've got a... Uh, prepared remarks here that I'm not going to read. You've already heard me uh, deliver one set of prepared remarks. Uh, I want to talk about four things, uh, Kelly, Cook, Stockdale, and you. Okay, because when it comes down to ethics and ethical behavior in this year that you have, this wonderful year that you have at the Naval War College, and while I'm looking at a lot of members of our foundation, I want to thank them for being here and for their support. These are tremendously successful Americans from any walk of life that you can imagine, and something about the Naval War College has inspired them to devote kind of the, the fruits of their labors towards your year here. And so whether it's Jeffrey Immelt, the CEO of General Electric, or these ethics conferences, or the food and beer that you, you know, open up our home, you'll all get to come in uh, to Quarters AA. Uh, it's because of the generosity and the leadership of the foundation. So thank you to the Naval War College Foundation for being here. But uh, yeah. But uh, Jamie, so I, Kelly, Cook, Stockdale, and you, uh, ethics. Uh, why are you here? I, I'm, if I seem, seem somewhat distracted, it's because I don't know when the last time it's happened, but there's how many four-star admirals are there on active duty in the U.S. Navy? There's 10. Eight of them are about 100 yards from here right now, and I'm at the ethics conference. But I told them, I told the CNO, sir, I know you're going to do fine. The only two that aren't here are Locklear, who's PACOM, and Stavridis, who's UCOM. They have got other things on their mind. They typically don't come to these meetings. But uh, I told them there's nothing more appropriate than once we bring the class together at convocation. First topic, ethics. It, 
it dominates, you know, they live in, most of those four stars are in Washington. Ethical behavior, the hard part, you know, flying the jet, operating the nuclear reactor, pulling the trigger, that's relatively easy compared to the second half of your career that we talked about this morning. You're gonna get into the, you're gonna live in the gray area, black and white, on and off, nade tops, checklists, uh, you know, rehearsals, those things, the easy part's over, now you're hitting the hard part. So let me get to the first topic is Kelly. Thank you, Admiral Kelly, for that way too generous uh, introduction. Uh, he talked a lot of technical stuff about why he came here and what he does. He came here for one reason. The CNO, the previous CNO, Admiral Roughhead, said the chair of the College of Leadership is going to be filled by the best leader we can find. And we looked for years to find Jamie Kelly. He commanded multiple ships, even though he's a naval aviator, he commanded, that, ask anybody, the best carrier constellation, the happiest ship. Nimitz said the best ships are the happiest ships, and Constellation under Jamie Kelly was the happiest aircraft carrier in the U.S. Navy. He went on to command the Ford deployed. The, if we have a tip of the spear in the Navy, it's the battle group that's out of Japan, and he commanded it, Kitty Hawk Battle Group. And then he went on to basically command the U.S. Navy in Japan. There's a built, note that he is not dead, and yet there's a building in Japan named after him, usually an honor that's reserved for you after you go to the other side. But uh, <laughs> Kelly's son was such an inspirational leader uh, his last six, at least six years of his career in Japan that, that uh, he's beloved over there. I made, I had the good fortune of accompanying him on his rock star-like return to Japan in the spring. So Jamie, so first topic is when the Navy does leadership, we usually associate a name with it because we want you to be inspired by those that went before you. And, you know, a third, a good part of your curriculum here is history, okay? We got you, you need to get the facts lined up. We had this grand strategy, uh, teaching grand strategy workshop last week, talk about humbling. We had some of the smartest people in the world talking about how do you teach grand strategy. Uh, we had... Uh, John Lewis Gaddis, who just won the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of George Kennan. If you, don't, if you haven't heard of George Kennan, you will by the end of the year. Uh, we, we had Ambassador Hill, uh, you know, who worked at the United Nations, wrote a biography on uh, Boutros, Boutros Ghali. We had some incredible minds from around the world, and they believe that the strategy department at Newport is world class, and that's why they come here. End up getting jobs here too, but we have a critical mass of excellence here. But it's the study of history, back to people, it's a study of history. You, just like Admiral Luce told us this morning, uh, you can study history and you can study the lessons of war and you can still get it wrong. But rest assured, if you don't study history and you don't study the lessons of war, you will get it wrong. So when it comes to leadership and ethical behavior, we believe in people. So that's why Admiral Kelly is the dean of our College of Leadership. So thanks, Jamie. Next is Martin Cook. Okay. The remarks I had were going to try to convince you that I operate on some intellectual plane about the theory of ethical behavior and internalization. Uh, you're getting me. Okay. I'm going to turn this over to Martin Cook. And then you're going to get, for those of you on the normal curve out there, two standard deviations of intellect, and whether it's in intellect or in leadership, because like Admiral Kelly said, if you're in an international uniform, you're going to be a flag officer, and you've got a really good chance of being the head of your Navy. If you're in a U.S. uniform, you've got a good chance of being a flag officer, and for, especially if you're in the Army, it seems, you got a good chance of being a four-star. They keep sending us uh, incredible people here. But the Marines, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, all our agencies, they send us great people here, and some of you are exceptionally bright, and we're going to make you work hard because we want to challenge you. We want everyone here to work hard. We, don't want it, we want it to be a good, unlike Navy Nuclear Power School, that just wants it to be a good place to be from, we also want this to be a good place to be at, but we believe that making it challenging is going to make it rewarding for all of you and give it the opportunity to change your life. So read every word if you can. We're not giving you more than you can do. It will be a challenge. I don't know how many of you PT every single day. He embellished. I PT 75% of the days. Uh, but uh, usually when I'm there, I see him. So he, he, must, he must be up there a lot too. 
But challenge yourself. You know, this, if this was sports, you're at the world's best gym. But if you walk in to the gym and watch people lift weights and watch people do cardio and watch people stretch, you will be no more flexible, have no more endurance, and be no stronger than had you just stayed at home. You're coming to the world's best war college, and you have the opportunity to leave here world class, but only if you pick up the weights, get on the treadmill, get on the floor, and that means reading. Okay, we're going to make you right, but it's up to you to decide. You'll be able to bluster your way through here and write and research. Um, but if you want to walk out of here with a life-changing experience, you need, to, you need to pick up the weights, you need to do the reading. So Martin Cook, he's the intellect we hired. Jamie Kelly, we went out and found the best leader we could find. Martin Cook, we went out and found the best intellect in the world we could find on the subject of military ethics. So when he talks, listen to him. He's connected, he edits the world famous journal on, on what's it called? Military. Journal of Military Ethics. He caught me in the library one time, I was reading it. Uh, but it's cool, the Journal of Military Ethics. He's one of the co-editors. Um, but so we got the best empirical leader, we got the best intellectual leader on the subject of ethics here. So on those two things, uh, I commend you to these two to listen to them and talk to them and pick up what they got. It's not an accident that we begin the year with ethics, we end the year with ethics, and in the middle, most of you will get a three-day course on ethics. It's important to everything that we do. Uh, you know, we just, we got charged with developing a leadership continuum um, for the entire Navy, which is pretty tall order. It's usually something that's either produced in Washington or it's produced by contractors. Well, the Navy took a different route. They said, we're not going to pay anybody to write down how we're going to develop leaders in the Navy. We're going to do it ourselves, because kind of out of money, too. Uh, but we're also, uh, we're also not going to do it in Washington. We're going to go to Newport Island, the home of Navy thought. We're going to turn it over to Jamie Kelly and his team, and they are going to come up with a strategy for b building a continuum of leadership. So that's a big project that we have. So I'll be happily followed by Martin Cook at the end. Who was the third person I said? Stockdale. You can't go anywhere in the Navy and not see that man's name, whether it's on the back, the transom of a Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyer, or the gate at North Island, or the leadership center at Annapolis, or the scholars that study ethical behavior. James Bond Stockdale was, was the man. And uh, you can see his portrait hanging up in the, in the president's passageway up there in, uh, in his summer white. But how did he end up at a state of intellectual development where he earned the Medal of Honor for leadership? And he will tell you, because he wrote it, uh, that it, it happened when he got sent off like you to graduate school. He was a fighter pilot, and they sent him to Stanford to study. What they send him to Stanford to study? Economics. They sent him there to study economics, but he lost, quickly lost interest in the science. Maybe he recognized that the, his fighter pilot days were going this way and his thinking and leading days were going this way. He gravitated toward the philosophy department at Stanford and he took those courses on classics. The Thucydides, you'll get a chance to read. I don't wanna mess up Martin, but he teaches an elective. Uh, is Colonel Gibbons here? The guy that yelled, beat, Ar beat Navy at the top of his lungs. Uh, those, two, those two guys teach a course, which is the course that Stockdale taught when he was president of the Naval War College. Uh, it's a fabulous course. You'll study the great thinkers. It's one of the many great opportunities you have here. But so what made Stockdale? Why did Stockdale go from being this world-class fighter pilot and leader of a squadron to this Medal of Honor winning leader in the you know, dungeons and solitary confinement of North Vietnam. Uh, he got it there by thinking, by spending a couple years thinking hard about what's it all about. And so you got this opportunity this year. And what, it, what it's all about is ethics and the decisions you make on how you're going to live your life, how you're going to treat the people that are put under your command, how you're going to treat your family. It, it's 24 hours a day. We are a profession of arms. We are not a nine to five job. We don't work bonus to bonus. We this is a profession and you guys have all entered into the professional stage for the rest of your career. 
So Stockdale, he's the man. I hope you take the elective. I hope you look at his picture there. Uh, truly a giant of leadership in, in the United States Navy. And finally, you. Okay, this is your choice. This is your year. You've been given this great gift, this one year of time, and you are going to decide what you do with it. Uh, to whom much is given, much is expected. And the Navy, the taxpayers of America, who are under such tremendous burdens to provide health care, to provide security for the oldest people in society, the people in society least able to take care of themselves. Look around this room. Look at all, calculate how many salaries in here are being paid for by the taxpayer. They think they're paying for you to fly a jet to operate a reactor 800 feet beneath the ocean. That's what they think they're paying for. But they trust us to organize, train, and equip you. And the way, the, the equipping we're doing this year is your mind. Okay, so you're here for a year. You have the opportunity to read, to think, to write, to decide how you're going to live the rest of your career and the rest of your life. But it's over to you on how you do it. Kelly, Cook, Stockdale from the grave, none of those people can make you do. It's a decision that you're going to make. Okay, so thanks again to the foundation for being here. Uh, thank you all again for your service to your countries uh, to date. Um, congratulations, you're getting, what did the Marine General say, the gully? I think he called the gulch or the gully? The quote there from this morning's remarks. Um, but Emeril Winnefeld said you were a great class. The CNO was happy that our first topic is, is ethics. Uh, congratulations again. Have a great year. I look forward to welcome you, welcoming you into Quarters AA up there and sitting in the back of your seminars and, and hearing, you know, the, the highlight of the year for the president is those Saturday mornings right after graduation when I'm walking to the pool. I'd been here about, I guess, two months and I, you know, I had my, I was in the zone walking over to the pool and I could feel something coming up behind me, and I turned behind me, and it was this like Toyota Supra pickup truck with the, you know, 24-inch airborne wing sticker in the window, and this guy that I never knew, I assume he was a major or a really young-looking lieutenant colonel, jumped out, said, sir, I, I didn't mean to run you over, I just want to tell you what a great school this is, that it, it changed my life, and it just put a big smile on my face because the fact that he said it. He didn't know me. I wasn't going to write a fitness report on him. He was getting ready to leave, but he said exactly what I felt. I put in the effort, and it changed me. It changed how I thought about the world. It changed how I read the newspaper. It, it, it's what motivated me to find out about this fellowship program, to go to Fletcher. It, it really is the opportunity to change your life. And I, was, and I went to the Naval Academy, you know, a trade school, and I essentially went to a trade school, graduate school, this one, but we've got a faculty here that I'm extremely proud of. So, okay, so much next time you'll want me to read the prepared remarks. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Congratulations. Now I'm going to turn it over to the second name on the list, Martin Cook. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, um, just one little item of administration, when you go to Q&A, we will turn off the recording, so you won't be in the least be intimidated to ask any questions that you like, okay? Um, could we have the first sli slide, Steve? Um, as the admirals mentioned, my title is um, Stockdale Chair of Professional Military Ethics. So I thought it was appropriate that we'd start with Admiral Stockdale's probably, unfortunately, most famous moment in the eyes of the American people. Most of you are too young to remember this moment, um, but I'm, we're going to play it now. So, uh, Steve, would you play the clip? Admiral Stockdale, your opening statement, please, sir. Who am I? Why am I here? <laughs> Now, that, that's kind of unfortunate because you may remember he was persuaded to run for the vice presidency on a third party ticket with Ross Perot on that occasion. And most Americans, if they know him at all, know him for that unfortunate moment where he looked a little over the hill, uh, not his proudest moment. But I want to take his question as the starting point for you. Um, who are you and why are you here? I mean, I think that's the topic we've been hearing about all day today. Uh, and there's a reason, as General Christensen said, that uh, the institution, not me, decided ethics is the topic that we should kick off with on the afternoon of convocation. So um, one reason the war colleges look the way they do is a historical reason. 
Uh, you may remember the, the major reform of the, our Defense Department uh, since 1948 was the Goldwater Nichols Defense Reform Act, which was intended to encourage greater jointness among the services. And that act was passed because of the perceived failure of the military to work jointly successfully in a number of very embarrassing operations that we went through. And so the Congress reached in and said, we're going to change the way you do business. Uh, we want to change it so that greater jointness is brought about. And so the reason that this room is full of as many different uniforms as it is just among the US folks is a result primarily of that Goldwater Nichols Reform Act. So let's think about what the assumptions were in the minds of the people that thought they needed to fix you, as it were, by making this reform. First of all, they felt that there were specific sp skills and bodies of knowledge that they needed, that they want to make sure that you got as you advance in rank. That is to say, on-the-job training was probably not going to be good enough. There were some specific educational components that needed to happen. They thought that that was best addressed in an intensive educational experience like this. As Admiral Christensen said, just do the math. Think about how much money the American people are spending on us collectively to run this institution. Somebody somewhere thinks this is worth an awful lot of time, effort, and money to make it happen. Um, so intellectual development of officers is something that is highly valued as measured by the fact that we created institutions like this. Um, point I just made. Now, the important thing to think about is these attributes that I'm talking about are something we only do for professions. We don't do this for employees at the DMV. You know, we train the employees of the DMV how to fill out the right forms, but that we can do that in an afternoon or two. We don't send them to school for very long periods of time. Only true professions do that. And that's what I want to talk about for the first few minutes. What are professions in, some, in a technical sense? Now, recently, our chairman, General Dempsey, has gotten very concerned about this. He's issued two white papers. If you haven't looked at them, I strongly suggest you go look at them off the chairman's website. One is called America's Military, A Profession of Arms, which is a short white paper laying out his understanding of the nature of, of the military as a profession. Uh, these are a few of the quotes from this document. We are renewing our commitment to the profession of arms. It's essential to ensure that we maintain the best led and best trained force in the world. Uh, earlier he'd said, after 10 years of war, it would be understandable that we might be losing our edge, losing our sense of professionalism. If we don't attend to it specifically and intentionally, there's no guaranteed assurance it'll be in place. Um, he said, I'm very worried about external trust, the trust of the American people toward its military. Uh, his predecessor, Admiral Mullen, convened a meeting in Washington the last January that he was in office, and he said the number one question that kept him up at night was the relationship between the U.S. military and the American people. He said, right, this is a direct quote, they don't know us and we don't know them. And that's what I worry about. Um, I'm an old guy. I'm, I, I went to college in 1969. So those of you who remember ancient history will remember what my freshman year was like. Um, we invaded Cambodia. Students were killed at Kent State. Um, there were, the National Guard was bivouacked on my quad most of my spring semester, and it wasn't safe to walk across campus in an ROTC uniform. So if you don't think that the American people can lose confidence in you, they can, and I've seen it, and it's pretty ugly. Right? So if we're not attentive to this, um, it's not this arrangement of, of the American people loving you is not a fixed quantity. It's something that depends on many things and could be lost. Um, with the election coming up, he made a point of stating this, which I hope is obvious to all American officers, but sometimes it's less obvious than you'd think it would be, that it's vitally important that you be apolitical, um, that your loyalty to the Constitution uh, and to constitutional processes be abundantly clear, uh, and that as you go through this year, as you talk about politics, as you inevitably will, 
try to be sensitive to the fact that where the line is between articulating a political opinion or having a political opinion and your core duty as a servant of the US Constitution. Another paper that uh, General Dempsey issued is this joint education white paper in which he lays out a vision of what this kind of thing is about. And here's some of what he said. Um, first, to state a really important point. We haven't had so many combat veterans in these classrooms since the end of Vietnam. This is an opportunity for a kind of seriousness of conversation that a, a largely peacetime force could not be having. Um, I went to work for the Army at the Army War College in 1998. Um, the military operations we were doing were all the Balkan operations, but it was mostly a garrison force. It hadn't deployed a lot, uh, certainly hadn't seen a lot of heavy combat. Uh, the conversations that went on then are very different than the conversations that we're going to be having now because of who you are and where you've been and what you've been through. Um, and that gives us a great opportunity to get much closer to the real deal in these conversations. Um, he says, this is what we're trying to do in professional military education, a broad education. This is not training. This is not learning specific subjects. It's trying to teach certain habits of mind. And I think as you listen to the Admiral speak, you see that in, in both cases, those habits of mind are ingrained in them. Um, and they're not necessarily the habits of mind that the early stages of a military career are optimized to develop, are they? So when we say that this is a transition point and a set of skills that got you here may not continue to make you successful, that it really is a different kind of world that you're maturing into, uh, that's what we have in mind. And so he says, each of you should seek to be a scholar. That's a weird thing coming from a four-star general, right? What I want you to be is scholars. Scholars, and not scholars of some general subject, but scholars of your profession, of the profession of arms. What would it mean, concretely, to be a scholar of the professional of arms? I'll try to articulate that in a minute. Okay, first what we've got to do is dispel or clarify this idea of what it is to be a profession. There is a very large literature in sociology on the concept of professions in which professions are distinguished from other kinds of things people do for jobs. Now, this is confused for us because we tend to use the word professional colloquially to, say, to mean anything people do for money. So we talk about professional athletes, or we talk about professional musicians, things like that. But in the sense that I'm interested in, that I want to articulate for you now, those are in not really professions in this sense. Professions have a very specific set of characteristics. And um, Don Snyder in the Army went around about 10 years ago asking this question. Are military officers professionals, or are they just obedient bureaucrats? Uh, I mean, you're obviously embedded in a big bureaucracy, so it could be easy to default to being obedient bureaucrats. But would it matter that you also be professionals? And, and why would it matter? Uh, that's a question we want to explore this afternoon. Now. First, audience participation portion of the afternoon. In the West, historically, by, and by historically I mean the late medieval, early modern period, there were only three things that counted as professions, three occupations. Doctors, lawyers, clergy, I heard, that's it. Doctors, lawyers, and clergy, those three. Now let's think about that for a minute. What do those three have in common that distinguishes them from other things? And please use the mics if you, if you, wanna, if you wanna play. I'll give you the official list in a minute, but let's just try to see what you guys can come up with. I, I can't hear that. They all take an oath. Uh, can you use your mic? Got a handy? Let me ask you about that oath. What's the, what's the nature of the oath? in general, not the specifics of the particular occupation, but what's the oath about? What's it articulate? No? Take medicine, the Hippocratic Oath. They all deal, deal with uh, people. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. They, they all deal with people, you know. They all deal with people, that's right. They deal with people in extremely sensitive areas too, right? I mean, part of the Hippocratic Oath, one of the things about a doctor is they're going to see you naked and know a lot of embarrassing things about you, right? 
So part of that oath is I'm not going to talk about that outside my professional activity. Part of, and why is that oath important? Because if I don't promise you that, I can't do my work. You won't trust me, right? You won't come to me and tell me what I need to know to treat you effectively. The same thing would go for my lawyer maintaining confidentiality about legal matters, right? Or the priest who hears my confession talk about embarrassing, right? Uh, the most embarrassing things I possibly could tell you. If, but I can't get absolution if we frame it in the Catholic context unless I tell the priest accurately what my sins are, right? So there's this, this relationship of trust grounded in a specific set of rules that aren't rules for other people. They're only rules for people in this profession, right? That distinguish them from other, from other folks. What else? Another characteristic. They're um, self-policing and organized. Great. Self-policing and organized. Can you say a little more about that if you can? How do well, we know that? An example like the bar. The bar examines and makes sure that they have the qualifications and you can be disbarred. The same with uh, medical doctors and clergy. Good. So they decide who's in, who's out, who gets disciplined, who, uh, who is not being treated appropriately. Um, uh, what are, are accountants professionals in the modern world? They used to be. And then after Enron, the Congress took their marbles away, right? Because they said, we don't trust you anymore. Uh, how about naval aviation after tailhook? Same drill, right? We don't trust you anymore. So it's a fragile thing, this, this self-policing. I mean, the society gives, society can take away, depending on what they, whether they think you're doing a good job with it or not. So let me go through my, my official list for you. They provide a service which is deemed essential to the society they serve. Think about those three. In terms of the values of the, of the societies they were in at the time, they're the most important things in society. Salvation, health, and justice. The most important things. In the case of the military, what does society entrust to you? Our very lives, our safety, our defense. Something vitally important to us. You have a highly, professions have a highly developed body of technical knowledge as measured by jargon. Somebody once said, all professions are conspiracies against lay people, uh, by which they meant, you know, the rest of us don't understand you. But the reason that we don't understand you is because you're drawing distinctions so fine that are essential for your work that... Uh, that a lay person couldn't possibly get them. You know? For me, a hand wave that's a bacterial infection is moderately informative. But if I'm the doc, I've got to know what bacterium exactly, right? And what antibiotic am I going to use? So a lot of what you have acquired over the course of your military careers is a body of knowledge, a body of professional expertise that lay people shouldn't be expected to have. Now, one of the things we'll have to explore in a minute is that means that when you're talking to your civilian masters, in some profound sense, you know a lot about things that they don't know so much about, right? But they tell you how you're going to use your expertise. That means it's going to be an uneven dialogue of all kinds of ethical complexity about how that conversation goes on. Um, they make discretionary decisions about the way to apply their knowledge. A bureaucrat doesn't make a lot of discretionary decisions. The guy at the DMV says, you got the form, you don't got the form. No form, no, no license, right? But a professional comes in, if I say, Hertz here, doc, the doc is starting to do something very complicated in her head. It's called differential diagnosis, right? Hertz here could be this, could be this, could be this. Uh, I, could, I could approach it this way, I could approach it that way. Um, now, when you're a very junior officer, you don't have a lot of discretion. Sometimes you have standard uh, techniques and procedures that you apply. But as you rise in rank, the realm of your discretion becomes larger and larger and larger. And if your comfort zone is only linear clarity, you may not be very successful at that level. Uh, and you're applying this knowledge to, in the service of your client. Right? Your job is to do the best thing for them. It's not about you. It's about your figuring out how to do the best thing for the client. Uh, we've talked about autonomy and collective responsibility. Uh, who gets the court martial military officers? Military officers, right? Uh, who gets to decide how the application of what levels of punishment uh, in the military? Military people. 
in general, as long as the society is still trusting you, as long, uh, uh, when, when, when they start to doubt it, then you may lose it. For example, there's a film going around right now uh, about sexual assault in the military. There's a movement in the Congress to take away the disciplining of sexual assault from the UCMJ and put it in the civil courts. Um, not sure whether that's going to go anywhere or not, but it's a kind of indication of one of those moments where we're not sure we're trusting you on that one, right? We may want to consider whether we take that away from you. Um, interest and promotion, uh, according to agreed upon standards, we know what you need to know to get in, to get promoted uh, at each level. Public trust we've hit heavily. Individual motivation is primarily service. You know, if you had a doc who said, um, sure, I have all this technical skill, but I'm really just in it for the money, uh, you would have some very real doubts about their professionalism, right? Similarly, we talk about selfless service in the, in the military. Of course, nobody is truly selfless. That would be a meaningless concept. But what we certainly mean is you need to balance fairly carefully the part of you that's the servant to the client with the part that's about you. Um, okay, now I mentioned already, this is the white paper uh, um, that the chairman put out. So back to our question, are military officers merely obedient bureaucrats or are they professionals and why would it matter? Okay, so what's all that got to do with ethics, which is the ostensible topic of this talk, right? First of all, professional ethics is different than personal ethics, right? There are rules that I have to follow, for example, as a lawyer, that would be immoral if I followed them as a layperson. Example, you tell me, as my client, that you committed murder. My job is to defend you. Now, most lawyers will tell you that I'd rather not know this, just don't tell me. I'll just do the defense without knowing. But if I do know, I nevertheless don't go call up the sheriff and say, guess what, he just confessed. Because that's not my job, right? In our legal system, that's not my job. Um, this, this specifically professional ethic is grounded in this unique trust relationship, uh, which has to be tended and maintained at all times. Um, so that means if you are a true professional, it's part of your job, it's part of your ethics to be constantly preparing yourself to be as prepared to serve the client well as you possibly can, right? So how about a doctor who said, you know, I do the surgery the way they taught me to do it in med school in 1985, I haven't read a journal since, I haven't gone to a professional development conference, I, it was good enough then, it's good enough now, right? You would say of that person that they are professionally unethical. There is information to be had how to do your job better, and you are not going out to acquire it. Right? And insofar as you're not doing that, you are failing in your professional ethics. That means that professional ethics has an intellectual component. It also means that it has a self-discipline component. And it has a conduct component. That is, you're expected to behave in a certain kind of way. OK, so what are some barriers to understanding ethics in the military? I think there are some very real ones. First of all, in general, you guys have a very limited moral vocabulary. You got two words that you like, integrity and professional. And they sort of one size fits all words, right? Uh, somebody's, quote, got real integrity, they're good. And the notion out there with integrity seems to be that this is like an A-B switch. You've either got it or you haven't got it, right? And if you have integrity, you'll be good in any environment and you'll be in incorruptible and nothing will get at you. Um, similarly, professional is used even more loosely, right? He's a real professional, can mean everything from well signed shoes to flies a combat aircraft very, very effectively. Um, another problem is, there's a natural tendency, and I don't blame you for this, to identify ethics with law. Why is that? Well, first of all, an awful lot of so-called ethics failures that hit the Navy Times or other, other journals like that are not really ethics failures. They're simple legal failures. People violated the law. They probably knew they were violating the law, and they got caught, right? So those are legal problems. Secondly, all of us get a, a so-called ethics brief annually, all the U.S. folks. Who gives it? 
the Jags, right? So inevitably you think because the Jag gives you the ethics talk, then that what would, more would there be to ethics beyond what the Jag is going to talk to me about? But as Admiral Christensen said, as you move into these gray areas, when you look at really hard world world cases, there are sometimes legal dimensions to them. But if you think a chat with your JAG is going to resolve all of the ambiguous situational decision-making stuff in front of you, you're, uh, you're living in a fool's paradise because it's, it's not going to be that way. Um, another reason to worry about, especially the integrity point, is there's something in, in experimental psychology called the person context debate. There's a ton of evidence that suggests that the way people behave is affected even by very small changes in the environment that they're in. This book that I'm mentioning, You're Not So Smart, and there's also a website, uh, is one Admiral Christensen, who's our former president, now the IG of the Navy, likes to talk. Weiskup. What did I say? Sorry. Admiral Weiskup, who is now the IG, goes around talking about this a lot. It's a very nice little book. It's a fun read. Uh, it just summarizes all kinds of things you think are true about you that are demonstrably false. Things you, th things you think you believe about you that are demonstrably false. Uh, let me just give you an example. Um, there was an experiment done um, in England where they put a tea trolley in the back corner of an office, and people were supposed to put in a, a, a 50 pence or something if they bought a cup of tea. Uh, on some days, the cup that you're going to put your, and nobody was observing this except a camera, okay? On some days, they would paint uh, a hand-painted flower on the cup. And when the flower was on the cup, a lot of people didn't pay for their coffee. On other days, they hand-painted a pair of eyes on the cup, and compliance went way up. Right? Uh, and what that goes to show you is that you know, we're hardwired by evolution or something to think if you're being observed, feel like you're being observed, even in this really cheesy little way, um, that it will affect your behavior. And the reason that matters is when we're looking at ethical failure in and relatively senior military officers, one of the things we'd like to understand a whole lot better is what about the environment changed for them and could we have done anything to help them to build some guardrails around that environment that would have kept this from happening? But if you keep using the integrity word as if that's a given, that's just a fixed quantity, then it doesn't lead you down this interesting path about let's think about context, how that affects things. How to have... Another study was done at Princeton Seminary they had uh, two groups of seminarians. They gave them both the same lecture on the Good Samaritan story from the New Testament, which, remember, is a story where a, a man from an ethnic group that would normally be hated uh, helps out a guy who's been injured when all of the supposed good people have already passed him by. And uh, Jesus uses this story as an example of uh, the important that, that ethnicity doesn't really matter, that the good person is the person who does the good thing. At least that's one interpretation of it. Um, in this study, one group is let go at the end of the talk, and there's an actor out in the lobby who, who's pretending to be in great distress. And as you might imagine, the seminarians stop and try to render aid to this guy. The other group is told at the end of the talk, there's an important meeting across campus in 10 minutes. It's vitally important that you be there. Don't miss it. And all but 20% of them blow right past him. Okay? Which goes to show that this, the small change of the pressured environment, the time-pressured environment, gets very different behavior out of people who presumably have very similar values, and if you ask them, would tell you very similar things about their beliefs, but demonstrably behave differently. So, what's the point? The point is that, that professional ethics is distinct from personal ethics. For example, you could be honest, loyal, and diligent, but incompetent. That is professionally unethical. You may be the nicest guy in the world, don't get me wrong, but we're not talking about how nice a person you are. We're talking about whether in your professional activity you are ethically responsible. Or if you are intellectually lazy in your professional growth, I will argue you are being unethical because it is your job to be as prepared as you can possibly be to bring your professional expertise to bear on the service of your client. A failure to adapt in the face of overwhelming evidence that you need to do so to be professionally effective is unethical. Let me give you an example. There's a book that came out about 18 months ago now called the, the Checklist Manifesto, written by a surgeon. 
This surgeon did a study and showed that if surgeons would just use a checklist before they closed body cavities, they would reduce the number of objects left in body cavities enormously. He's having extreme difficulty persuading surgeons to use this checklist because their culture, their attitude is, I don't need those stinking checklists, right? I, I, don't, I don't need to do that. But wait a minute, I just showed you that you would be far more successful in your professional activity if you adopt this minor change in the way you do business. But the culture is so strong that I almost can't talk you into it. Now, nobody in the military would, would be committed to culture that strongly, I'm sure. You know, but it's a possibility that you might want to think about. Um, bottom line, if failure to serve the client's interests is unethical. That's what you are there for. You're not there to do your thing. You're not there to enjoy the cool toys we bought you. You're not there to, uh, to enjoy your career path or to admire the lovely ocean. You're there to serve the client's interests. So PME assumes that you're on a developmental path. A lot of people who are pretty smart spend a lot of time trying to figure out what do you need when across this career path. Um, and believe me, although you will complain about bits of it, we, we spend more time than you can possibly imagine continuing to tweak and, and change and debate what should be in, what should be out of the core. Because, you know, um, the core is just uh, uh, God's way of preventing everything from happening all at once because there's so many good ideas about what I got, should go in there, we're constantly fighting about it. So is ethics developmental in the same way? I am going to suggest to you that it is, and I think Admiral Christensen suggested this as well. Uh, for one reason, the environment that you evolve into as you become more senior is characterized by these four elements. This is a phrase invented by Carlisle, uh, the Army War College, VUCA. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. You are evolving into a VUCA world. Let me go through each of the four points. Volatile, what does it mean? It's a term borrowed from chemistry, right? Volatile means something that evaporates very quickly. What it means in your life is, the way I like to put it to the major command course, is there's a very low probability that you'll be doing today what you came into the office thinking you'd be doing today. Something else will happen. Something else will arise that suddenly becomes urgent. And then you're going to have a very a deeper challenge. How do I distinguish the urgent from the important? And how do I appropriately attend to the urgent in such a way that I don't completely lose course and speed on the important stuff, right? I mean, that, that's a very hard skill. Uh, what have we done to prepare you to make those judgments? Um, it's uncertain. I don't just mean that you haven't yet found out enough to know. I mean that you can't find out enough to know everything that you want to know. Um, I once worked for uh, a very senior officer, who will go unnamed, who simply could not make a decision. I sat hours and hours of meetings uh, with large groups of people trying to go over this stuff. And finally, I was complaining about this, and the infantry colonel I was then working for said, well, here's the problem. He's a cavalry officer. I said, what? He said, yeah, think about what cavalry guys do. They drive around the battlefield and they acquire information, which they then pass to other people who make decisions. That's what he's doing. He's driving around acquiring information. Uh, he'll never have enough. He'll, he'll never have enough. But, of course, if you're in that trap, if you think you need to have enough, uh, you'll never get there because the environments you're going to are inherently uncertain. It's not just that you don't know enough today. They're inherently uncertain, which means you're going to have to act in the face of uncertainty and have to know when... Do I have enough certainty to act, and when should I just refrain from acting because I don't know enough? I mean, how, how do you figure that out? It's complex. My friend uh, John, um, uh, John, who's away today, was mentioned, um, John Meyer, uh, likes to distinguish the difference between complex and complicated. He said, you know, you guys are well trained to deal with complicated problems. You deal with complicated problems by breaking them into small digestible bites, and then you have a, a military decision process to very, in a very linear way solve each little bit of it, and then you add them all up, and you've got a solution to this very complicated problem. And that works pretty well. But it only works for complicated problems. It doesn't work for complex ones, because complex ones are not like that. They're not subject to the same kind of linear analysis. They're uh, just messy. And related to that, they're ambiguous. That is to say, um, 
you're not going to know uh, for sure what's going on, maybe even after you've done it. Um, so one of the reasons this creates problems for military people, and I got this idea from a friend of mine, George Reed, who's a retired Army colonel who teaches leadership now at the University of San Diego. He said, think about what military organizations do when somebody screws up. They basically got three solutions to this problem. You fire the leadership, you mandate new training, and you issue a new policy. Right? And if you do that over and over again, you end up like Gulliver tied down by the Lilliputians. You can't move, right? You got so many of these uh, policies and stuff tying you down. But the problem with this is there are some problems that are not really going to be fixed by that Holy Trinity at all. Um, I like to call these system problems. Uh, a very simple example that I observed when, in the Army was when General Shinseki came in as Chief of Staff of the Army, he called up Carlisle and said, I need 10 colonels to tell me how to fix the Army readiness reporting system because I know, I have no idea how ready the Army is. Why don't I know? Because nobody anywhere in the system is allowed to report that they're lower than C2. And if they try to do it, they'll be counseled never to do it again and pencil whipped. So he said, I really don't know. Um, so um, the solution to that had to be, so here, ask yourself this ethics question. Is a company commander, or an O3, a captain in the Army, who wrongly, falsely reports his unit to be C2 lying? Well, in the ordinary sense of English, sure. He deliberately, falsely stating something that he or she knows to be untrue. If that's not a lie, what is, right? On the other hand, that's a totally dim-witted way of looking at the problem, right? That's, that's not helpful, because the reason that the captain's behaving that way is the system is driving the behavior, and until somebody with the appropriate rank fixes that system, it's not going to get fixed. Nothing's going to change, right? So one of the things I think you need to think about as you rise in rank is you start controlling systems, bigger and smaller pieces of it. We heard uh, the Admiral this morning, I thought in a very eloquent talk, suggest that you know, maybe we're not questioning our assumptions enough. Right? Maybe we haven't asked ourselves whether uh, what we're taking for granted is really to be taken for granted. And he, he challenged all of you to do that, right? One of the things to challenge is the system. Uh, for example, uh, John Meyer and I go over to talk to the major command course, which is all the 06 commanders on base. And one, we often end up with them complaining at great length about the in-service system in the Navy. We just get into a long drill about this, and we can't get them out of that rat hole once they get in it. Um, and for you non-Navy people, just trust me. It's an example of one of these system things, okay? Um, and, and the sense is we've got to fix the in-service system. Okay, this is something the Navy is very worried about. This is from an article in the current Naval War College Review, which is very, very good. I highly recommend it to you. Captain Light's uh, The uh, Navy's Moral Compass, and it's sitting in racks in the library. So just pick it up as you go by and read Captain Light's piece. This is dismissals for cause over the last oh, 20 years or so. Um, the dark color are uh, dismissals caused by personal misconduct. And the light color bars are dismissals caused by professional stuff, like you know, uh, running aground or, or shearing a shaft or something like that. So notice, the vast bulk of them are personal failure, um, and they are rapidly increasing. And they've been increasing mostly at relatively high ranks, by the way. 06 rank, major command rank, things like that. Now, so what's going on? I, I don't think anybody knows. The, the Navy certainly doesn't know. The Navy would love to know uh, what's going on here. But in any case, and, and by the way, I, we, I don't think the, service, the other services don't report so publicly as the Navy, so I don't know what these curves would look like in the other services. So I'm not, not picking on them because they're better. I just don't know. Um, but in any case, this is an identified problem. So what's going on? Um, is it maybe something about this, either this contextual stuff there's something about the leap from 05 command to 06 command that makes the environment so different that we're not preparing people well for it. That's a possibility. Uh, is it just that we're not developing our leaders well enough so that by the time they get to that level, they're fully trustworthy? Nobody knows, right? But these are, in any case, it's an alarming curve, right? So um, in the core course in NSA, 
you're, both go, you're all going to read a, an article from the Harvard Business Review called The Bathsheba Syndrome uh, that has caught the attention of the Navy as the Navy tries to explain all this. I'm not going to labor this a lot because you'll be reading the article. Uh, we had the author of it here last spring. If you go to YouTube and go to Naval War College, you can find videos of the ethics conferences for the last three years. And Clint Longnecker is the guy's name who wrote the article. Um, you can watch his video if you want to see it. But he's interested, he's primarily a business guy, uh, a business professor. He's interested in the, in the similar phenomenon of failure of senior business leaders. You, you know, you practically read about this every week or two. Someone who's the president of a big company or, you know, a CEO of something or other has been, you know, considered a, a, a hero in the business community and then does something colossally stupid and loses it all. Um, this happens all the time. Um, and so they've developed a hypothesis about this. With, it's just a hypothesis. It's a thought piece that these four elements, success leading to loss of focus, privileged access to people, information, stuff, unconstrained control of organizational resources, and most importantly, the illusion that you have enough power that if you screw up, you can cover it up. And by the way, isn't it depressing every time you see one of these things, how often people spend the first day, week, two weeks, trying to deny, 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 before they finally just have to say, yeah, okay, I did it, and, you know, um, and that's gonna happen. So, I mean, how in the world do they think they're gonna get away with that? So, um, uh, in, the, in one of the Navy's IG reports, they actually glum onto this hypothesis as the best thing they can think of to maybe explain what these DFCs are being caused by. But it's, again, purely a hypothetical thing. Um, all right, so I'm arguing that there is such a thing as ethical VUCA, and it gets worse as you get higher in rank. Why? Well, one reason why, I think, is because the web of obligations you have gets far more complicated. Um, you know, when you're a relatively junior officer, you've got your unit, your department, your, uh, your, your um, company in the Army, um, your squadron in the Air Force, and you can basically see it, right? It's there. You can talk to your people. They're there. You report up, usually just to one person or one, one level above you. Life's relatively simple. Go up to the level of CNO and try to think about what CNO has to worry about. CNO has to worry about the relationship with the administration, has to worry about the Navy 20 years from now, has to worry about international partners, has to worry about the other services, has to worry about the, the trust and confidence of the American people in general. Um, uh, all of that stuff. And how do you prioritize on any given day which of those things I'm focusing on? Which of those things I need to be worried about? And if you can find an algorithm for that, please publish it right away, because uh, the, the point is that the, the complexity just grows. And, you know, you can be, uh, one of the ways you can mess up is be being narrowly focused and perfectly right on one subset of the problem. But while you're doing that, you're ignoring this other thing that's going to come back and bite you, right? Um, so there's a kind of almost ethics horizon scanning that's got to be going on, just like scanning your instruments if you're an aviator. Um, General McMaster was here a couple of years ago and gave a very good talk. Um, he's now a major general. He was a brigadier when he said this. And he says this about the Army, about the Army in Iraq. He was very self-critical of his own service. He said, it took us way, way too long to figure out that we needed to adapt. We insisted on doing things the way we had trained for, the way we were comfortable with, uh, even when objective reality was staring us in the face that we were failing, right? Um, and eventually had, had to do it. Um, so one area where you have to think quite a lot, and I know Admiral Christensen just went to North Carolina for a conference on this, so our conference in November will focus pretty heavily on this question of so-called civil-military relations, or how do you balance your professional expertise with the fact that you're under civilian control? So that means when a president or a sec def is trying to make a decision about what to do with the military, the people who genuinely have the professional knowledge in the room are the people in the uniforms. But they're not the people who have the decision authority, right? So getting that dialogue properly balanced is a very tricky matter, and it's obviously very personality driven. And it means that as you rise in rank, if you become one of those advisor people, you know, your personal relationship with the decision maker is going to be very, very important. Um, they're not going to just necessarily take your positional authority 
as the last word on why they should listen to you. Uh, a couple of US ex examples recently. Um, you may remember the so-called revolt of the generals under uh, Rumsfeld, where six very recently retired, very senior officers from positions of certain knowledge of the real deal went in print calling for the resignation of the SECDEF. Now, they were retired, but very recently retired. They weren't like, you know, guys who've been out 15 years who were just giving their opinion on Fox News or something. These were people who came right out of operational units where they knew what they were talking about and said, you know, we think the Secretary of Defense should be replaced. Was that an exercise of professional judgment or was it insubordination? And does the fact that they're retired decisively settle the question or doesn't it? I think we'll have to talk about that. Um, we had Admiral Keene up here a couple of years ago, somewhat controversially. He was the re retired Vice Chief of Staff of the Army who uh, tells this story. I heard him at Leavenworth and we, we had him tell it here. Um, you know, he's sitting there watching the TV. He's retired. He's looking at Iraq. He said, we're losing this. If we don't change what we're doing, we will not be successful. So he gets on the phone with guys at the American Enterprise Institute. They cobble together the so-called surge sell it to the president over the heads of the Joint Chiefs, and that's the policy that gets executed. Now, is that an exercise of professional military judgment or being completely outside the lane of a retired officer meddling with the people who actually have the responsibility to run the service? You tell me. Uh, and don't tell me it sort of worked out okay, so therefore we know the answer, right? That's, that doesn't work. It just that it sort of worked out okay. Or General McChrystal. Um, whatever you think about that, um, although his personal remarks were not particularly bad in my personal opinion, he's clearly allowed an atmosphere to grow up among his staff of disrespectful talking about civilian authorities that um, had pretty severe consequences for him. So, um, and, and this has been bad just in the last 10 years. How bad do you think it's going to get with the budget cuts? I mean, as we heard this morning, I think it's going to be a really big challenge for the uniformed military to be seriously professional and ethical about this and not just defend rice bowls. Because you, you're not going to get all the rice bowls, right? So somebody's going to have to make the really no kidding decision. What force structures are we going to be able to afford that will best meet our, the needs of our client going forward? And, I, and nobody sitting here now has a clue, and you guys are going to have to do it, right? You're going to go out of here and literally be the people who have to manage that. But I, I think the normal way of salami slicing among the services would be a path to disaster. So it's going to have to be some real focus on capabilities required. So we'll do this in November for at least the better part of one of the two days in November. Okay. Now, if I've been at all persuasive, I'm going to ask you this question. How is this a military ethics question? How is this a professional military ethics question? Anybody? Have to react to it. Because if it's true and the, and the missile was effective, what? 5,000 people die, you got 11 carriers, um, be a really bad day, right? Um, so it probably means you're going to have to rethink how the Navy does business in very fundamental ways, ways that haven't really been thought about a lot since World War II, right? Um, that's been around. Um, Secretary Gates said this on his way out the door about the budget. I don't think we have to labor it, but that's my point earlier about I mean, the last 10 years, the military budget has enormously ballooned, right? So you've, we've been able to buy some of almost everything. Um, that's over. Um, so if you are leaders of a profession, think about the things that you're going to need to be thinking about that aren't obviously ethics questions, but I want to argue raise ethics questions. Um, We've already talked about force structure campaign planning, promotion systems. What kind of officers should be promoted? You know, it's commonly said ducks pick ducks, but what if you don't need ducks anymore? What if you don't need ducks? Um, are ducks able to realize that they don't need to pick more ducks? 
Can we educate them to be smart enough to know that? Um, in the Army case, it took radical surgery to change who was on the promotion board, right? Um, to get General McMaster promoted, for example, who was probably going nowhere until Petraeus was made the chair, head of the promotion board. Um, Civil Mill we've talked about. Okay, this is the Naval War College mission. And I just want to end with this note uh, to see if we can pick out of the mission itself things that look like military ethics and, and of the professional sort I've been talking about. So does anybody see in that part of the mission things that track with what I have been suggesting to you? Don't be shy. I know it's the first day for most of you, but please. Current, rigorous, and relevant. Okay. Can you elaborate just a little bit? Well, based on your presentation earlier, as professional ethics requires us to do just that, remain current, be rigorous in our continued study, and to be relevant to the changing environment. Great, great. Trust and confidence, I think we've hit pretty hard already. I won't labor it. Uh, Here's some more of the mission. Sem point, the one you just made, anticipating future challenges, thinking into the future, uh, assessing strategic and operational concepts to overcome these challenges. That's my carrier killing missile, among other things, is it not? Um, analytical products that inform Navy leadership. Improve the capability to plan, execute, and function cohesively, that is to do your professional business well. Is everybody seeing reasonably well? All of these are part of that professional responsibility I've tried to articulate. Guess where we end up? Maintaining the bond of trust between the nation and its military. Okay, now, General McMaster made a couple more points here. And I just want to reiterate them because, you know, I'm, I'm just this professor telling you this. So here's a, a very impressive and very smart Army two-star telling you, I think, pretty much the same thing. Covenant is... Most of you probably know it's a religious word, right? A covenant is like a contract on steroids. Right? I mean, it's not just a legal thing. It's a, it's a, a deeply held bond of trust um, that goes both ways. Um, okay, General Dempsey last year gave some testimony to the Senate Armed Services Committee that is the note I thought we would end on. He said a very interesting things about complexity, a theme I've already tried to hit. Einstein says, if you have an hour to save the world, spend 55 minutes of it understanding the problem and five minutes trying to solve it. He says, military culture, that's never what we do. Never what we do. We charge in immediately to trying to solve the problem before we even thought. Have you ever watched a group of military people start to self-task organize if you give them a simple little task? They, they just do this, right? They immediately start thrashing around looking for solutions. Um, it's, it's kind of what you do, what we've trained you to do. But Dempsey, uh, Dempsey is really interesting. He says, um, we um, need to develop leaders for the future that are different than that. We really haven't changed our leader development systems, he says, but we really should because the nature of the problems is changing. Um, so I would say to you, what's your year about? Spend 55 minutes trying to understand your problem. All right, thanks very much, and we'll move to Q&A.